Hi everyone. I'm going to get going because there's like the big ceremony and stuff at six, isn't there? So I'm going to get going. Um, thank you for coming to my talk. This is the last talk of DrupalCon. Um, and I'm going to talk to you for the next 20 minutes about UX and how we can use the power of UX to make Drupal better and sell it more effectively in the process. I'm Emma. I'm the user experience manager at Edinburgh University. Uh, our web estate's built on Drupal, so I'm going to draw my experience from that role for my talk today. But I'm also going to draw my experience of contributing to Drupal over the past year as part of different groups. Okay, so here's what I'm going to cover. I talk quite quickly and I try and pack a lot into my talks. I like to give good value for my talks. So you can scan my QR code there and you can get um, access to this deck and also a resources deck because I'll cover some quite big stuff in this talk today that I won't have time to go into in detail. So you can follow that up afterwards if you're interested. But here's what I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk about the Promote Drupal initiative and how we've used UX as part of that group to understand how people decide on Drupal and CMSs in general. Um, I'm then going to set that in context, thinking about the Drupal ecosystem. I'm going to show you a huge map I made um, and talk about how improving UX in one part of the ecosystem can have a ripple effect. I'm then going to leave you with some, an introduction into a couple of practical approaches, habits if you like, um, that you can adopt in your work um, to improve UX and help promote Drupal in the process. Okay, so quickly about Promote Drupal. We've heard a lot about this um, today in the initiatives and earlier in the week in the Dries Notes. Um, we're a group of individuals. We meet every couple of weeks and we have a focus on making Drupal promoted, uh, promoting Drupal more effectively, increasing adoption and so on. So we bring together different expertise. Some of us work in branding, some of us content, some of us UX, there's some developers in there as well. And we kind of brainstorm this. We think about messages, we think about channels, we think about everything really to do with promoting Drupal. And one of the things we've been focusing on over the last year really is thinking about how people evaluate Drupal as well as other CMSs to make decisions about that, to make a decision about is this the right CMS for me? And we work closely with the Drupal Association with that. So how do people decide on Drupal and what's that got to do with UX? Before I get into that, I just want to share this definition of UX. Um, kind of a reminder for me, a lot of my work um, with UX falls into UI, making decisions about user interfaces, usability, but actually UX is way bigger than that. UX is concerned with how people perceive products, services, systems, how they expect them to work, how they make them feel, how they respond to them. So with that, it's really closely linked to behavioral psychology. It's rooted in behavioral psychology and how we as humans think, act, and behave. Um, and for that reason, it's really closely linked to decision making. So here you can see a spectrum of how people make decisions. So when you're in a kind of comfortable UX space, when the UX is as you expect, you're not thinking, it's very easy to make a decision because you feel comfortable. You can rely on norms and habits to make a decision. Conversely, at the other end of the spectrum, if you're in a space where the UX is not as you expect, it's kind of scratchy, for want of a better word, it doesn't really sit with you, that's when people will draw on other information, gather data, do some analysis. It's a lot harder to make a decision. It takes a lot more cognitive load. So when we're thinking about, as we do in the Promote Drupal group, how do we convince people to decide Drupal, we want to shift it towards that end, towards the no thinking, so that it's really easy to make decisions. So good UX correlates with making it easier for people to decide on Drupal. So what does good UX look like then for somebody evaluating all the CMSs that are out there? Drupal is one of them. To get into this, we did some work in the Promote Drupal group and we delved into a lot of research. The Drupal Association supported us with this, um, sharing some of this research about Drupal personas. And we did a deep dive into this research and under, try to understand some common themes that were coming out about how people decide on Drupal and what, what Drupal means to them, what CMSs mean to them. And we used a construct that we use in UX called jobs to be done, which is a way of framing a priority for a person or a group of people in a particular context. And four things kind of came out of that, that when people are deciding on a CMS, they want to be clear about digital experiences it can achieve. Whatever organization they work in, they will have things they want to achieve, goals, targets, and they want to see a direct path of how that CMS can support them in that. 
kind of stretch goal connected to that is an inspiration path. So they'll have a vision for like five, 10 years of where they want to see their organization. And they want to see that the CMS they're going to choose is going to help them on that path. And again, that direct connection. Practical side of things, they want to size up the cost. How much is this going to cost me? Is this going to be my budget to run, maintain, um, and, and keep this going? And also, compliance issue, right, is really important. They want to feel reassured that whatever CMS they, they choose can tick the compliance boxes. They don't want to get sued. They want to make sure that the data, the privacy, the accessibility, and security is covered. So to find out, to address those jobs, the evaluator person can go to various sources to get information to kind of help them make that decision. Obviously, Drupal.org is a key channel that they can go and we put out content and we did a deep dive into this as well, looking at the content that's on Drupal.org that can support this. So case studies, industry examples, documentation, guides, it's all there to be read for somebody making that decision. But actually, people make decisions based very strongly on what they hear and what they learn from other people who are like them. So that's where things like word of mouth comes in, reputation, what they learn from technical forums, peer networks, what they hear from staff. This is the kind of thing that is more impactful when it comes to like, satisfying those jobs. And that's where this stuff comes in. There's too much to read on this slide, and that's deliberate because I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, kind of winds me up that this stuff is still out there about Drupal, but it is out there. So when people are making decisions about, is Drupal the right CMS for me? They do find stuff like it's just for developers, it's too technical, it's a steep learning curve, there's less optimal content experience, um, and so on. So that is all out there in the ecosystem. So that brings me on to the ecosystem, and this is where the big map comes in. Because to try and change this, to try and make Drupal shine, and to promote Drupal better, we need to understand that the part of Drupal that we work in, we have access to the bigger ecosystem and that can help promote it more effectively. So to do that, we need to visualize it. I told you that there was a big map, right? So when I work, I work in UX and we do research in UX and we need somewhere to put all that research. And for me, this is how it usually turns out on a mirror board, a big massive map. And this maps out like in my head, who's impacted by Drupal and what they care about. Because for me, it was important to understand the work I'm doing with Drupal, how can that help promote it better? The work that we're all doing, all the great stuff that's happening in Drupal, how can we, make, how can we turn that into promotion? So if you like maps, you can get this from my resources thing. If you don't, like I've got your back, it's fine. We're just gonna use it as an illustration. I'm gonna talk about a couple of examples to show you what I mean and explain how caring about UX and concentrating on UX in your corner of the Drupal ecosystem can actually have a better, a wider effect. So let's take documentation. So documentation tends to fall in with developers, right? Um, that's something that they care about. Um, in the usability group, Aaron and I are there every Friday and we look at documentation and we think, how can we improve this documentation? How can we make it more user-friendly? How can we make it more intuitive? And that benefits the developers that are using it. But also, there's a knock-on effect, because better documentation leads to better onboarding. Swells the stuff on um, Drupal.org in the resources section, increases the talent, makes training easier. And the big kind of star one is the one that's gonna help promote Drupal more effectively, because over time, caring about the UX of documentation helps to push the needle with stuff like technical communication, and that stuff that the C-suite, the CTOs, the CIOs, the chief executives care about, and those are the folks that are in a position to make decisions on their CMS. Let me give you another example with taxonomies. Hopefully some of you made um, Michelle Jenkins' talk earlier today about taxonomies, it was brilliant. Um, again, taxonomies is something that we tend to think, like developers deal with these and they grapple with these and they make them work. So if they improve the UX and they care about the UX, then that, that makes things better for them. But also, that can get noticed by marketers because they can realize how taxonomies can help them deliver optimized experiences, personalization. Related to that, content specialists get excited to see how adaptive content can come in, content localization. And again, the big kind of shiny stuff is this getting picked up by industry ports, insight data, Gartner, Gartner reports, the stuff that crosses the desk of the people that are in positions to make decisions about CMS. 
So summing all that up, basically care about UX because it makes Drupal better um, and that can have a knock-on effect in the ecosystem. And I guess conversely, like think of it the other way, don't, don't let suboptimal UX come into Drupal because we have a really great thing going here. We have a community and we have the power to actually make the UX as good as we want it to be. And that is not the case with a lot of software that we are forced to use in our lives. So like there's my shameless plug there. But I understand that UX is hard and nobody understands that more than me because I'm a UX manager. So when you do it, you really want to make sure it has the most value. And why not make sure it helps promote Drupal in the process? So to do that, I'm sorry, but we have to go back to these because these are out there. And so we need to adopt one of these myths, misconceptions, one that resonates to you and take it and, and like get comfortable with this being a problem that you're going to kind of hold in your brain is the first stage. The second stage is moving into um, UX design processes. So Think of those as problems, think of those as blockers, think of them as challenges to overcome, basically. Get comfortable with being in the problem space. Um, some of you may have seen this before. This is the double diamond. Um, it's a UX design process. Sorry, it's a design process and we adopt it as part of UX work. The idea is you start off at one end of the diamond in the problem space. You ideate over lots of problems, pain points, surface them all. You narrow in on the priority one, the one that's really the big hitter, or more than one. You then ideate again, come up with some more solutions, and then you focus in and deliver um, your ideal solution. And then you do it all over again. Um, and it looks really nice and easy when it's <laughs> like that. But in my experience with something like Drupal, we are so spoiled for solutions. We have all the solutions, we have multiple solutions for everything. But what's really difficult is trying to match those with the problems because the problems are big and woolly and poorly defined. And they're those myths and misconceptions that it's hard to kind of attach the solution to that problem and really make the solution shine. So practical empathy is a kind of habit or a mindset that you can adopt to, with an adopted problem um, to kind of help you address how to, to address, to help you kind of take it on board and help, help you address it. So practical empathy, I've summarized the entire book in like one slide, but the practical empathy is a technique that Indy Young pioneered. Um, she uh, does a lot of work with UX, there's various talks about this, and it's all about getting into the head of the person that's experiencing this problem, because a problem is really only a problem until you, it's not really tangible until you understand who's experiencing it and, and kind of understand why they're experiencing it, because then you can start to think about how you make it better. So you take your big problem from your myths and misconceptions, whichever one you want, and think about like who, who, does, who cares about this and who has got the power to make this better, what matters to them, and how do they deal with this now? Is this, big enough, is this a big enough problem in their life that they have to deal with it now? So I'm going to give you an example here, like the it's too technical thing that's out there. This I see as a problem. I see that marketers have the power to help address this problem. And I think this problem matters to them because they really want to be able to sell Drupal and they need tangible case studies, examples to be able to, to do that. Um, and tangible experiences, they really need to translate the tech into something that, that they can talk about. Stuff they care about in general, they're masters at stories and narratives, right? Think of them, I guess, as the town crier in the village analogy. They, they want to shout about Drupal, but they need stuff to be able to shout about um, and, and tell it into a story. They want metrics, they want data because they'll have targets and goals in mind. And they really value rich descriptions, the more detail the better. Because they don't have that now, because this problem doesn't, it, this problem exists and that is it's difficult to get this information about Drupal now, Drupal ends up being sold on a promise, on a kind of vague, abstract flexibility, consistency, compliance, that kind of thing. And it's hard for people to understand how does that relate to my organization, why should I um, adopt Drupal? So when you've gone through that process, and that, like, that process takes a while, right? Um, problem mapping, getting comfortable with problem takes a while, but it sets things up for the next stage moving into that solution diamond, which is, um, and, and here's another technique that I'm gonna share with you, which is opportunity uh, solution mapping. 
This comes from another book, Continuous Discovery Habits, which I love because it really is a habit, it's this kind of mindset. How this works, this is an opportunity solution tree. Um, you set in mind your problem, you set in your mind like the desired outcome, the behavior change you want to see. So that would be marketers being able to wax lyrical about all the tangible, wonderful digital experiences Drupal can achieve. The opportunities come in what you know about that person, what you learned when you empathized with them from that practical perspective. So taking the narratives and stories, maybe there's a solution space there in terms of gathering weak notes. Maybe there's an opportunity to work with agencies to, to gather reflective notes on implementations so that that could provide information for stories later on. You take the data and numbers thing that you know matters to marketers and think, okay, what have we got in terms of data and numbers, metrics that we've got now, and what are we not measuring? Probably more to the point that we could be gathering to start getting that information together to, to put in front of marketers to help them do their job. Rich descriptions, again, we have a wealth of information in documentation. Um, it's chiefly aimed at developers, but maybe there's a way of framing some of that so that it's more in more plain language, it's kind of de-technical. I noticed there's quite a lot of uh, talks this DrupalCon about technical language and technical writing. Um, so perhaps there's an opportunity there. And like these are all question marks because they're just ideas. But hopefully you can see how you can take a problem, drill it down, and then get to solutions and see how some of those solutions that we've got already in Drupal can feed into those bigger problems. So I'm going to wrap up because I can hear clapping, um, but just to recap, obviously UX will save the world, right? Talk done. Um, so we've just talked about how UX has been used in Promote Drupal. We've talked about how UX is linked to decision making, and it's not just about interfaces. We've talked about how you should care about UX in whatever part of Drupal you work in because it can have a wider effect. Um, and I've left you with a couple, a taster into a couple of techniques um, about how you can adopt that. I probably have no time for questions, but if you want to connect with me afterwards and hit me up for questions, I'm quite happy for you to do that. Thank you. <laughs>